thrilled to start off PLDI 2018 by telling you about my work on verifying web pages. So web pages are our windows to getting education, getting a job, getting healthcare. And so web pages have grown into full-fledged programs of their own accord. So for example, this is healthcare.gov. This is the website through which Americans buy health insurance. And it is 3.6 million lines of code. So since healthcare is important, we would like to ensure that these lines of code do not contain bugs. And there's been some fantastic work, among others from this community, on ensuring the absence of bugs in general purpose languages, like that used in the backends of web pages. But until now, there's been substantially less work on ensuring the absence of bugs in layout code. And that's why my work is focusing on automatic verification of web page layouts. But before I tell you more about my work, I want to explain why this is hard. And it's because web page layouts have complex behaviors across which we must ensure important correctness properties. Now, the complex behaviors I'm talking about, I mean multiple layouts and responsive design. So let me show you what that looks like. Here's healthcare.gov. And what I'm doing is resizing the size of the browser window. So if web page layouts are programs, that is an input. And you can see that the page is adapting to the changing browser width, among other things, by switching entirely to a mobile layout right there. OK, so see, these are some of the complex behaviors that we have to deal with. And across these behaviors, we must ensure that web pages are usable, they're accessible, they're mobile friendly. And this is not just a matter of good software engineering. Of course, it is good software engineering. But it's also a legal matter. Uh, the healthcare.gov website is an American site, so it's covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And pages in Europe, in Japan, and Australia have analogous laws that they have to follow. So I want to show you how this can fail. And uh, when I do that, please pay attention to that search button in the top right of the page. So what I'm going to do now is increase the size of my browser's default font. And that's something that a visually impaired user would do because it's difficult for them to see very small text. So you can see that if I increase the font size one click, that's 10%, the page adapts. And if I increase it one click more, again, watch this search button, you'll see that that search button has mysteriously disappeared. It is occluded by this header image. And of course, as you continue increasing the font size, you know, the problem just continues getting worse. So these are the sorts of bugs that can make pages less usable for certain classes of users. And they're the sort of bugs we'd like to avoid. So if we've got these complex behaviors across which we must ensure correctness properties, what do we do? Well, our community has tackled this problem in the past, and it's come up with ideas like automatic verification of these properties. So here I'm proposing automatic verification, but for web page layouts. So I've built this tool. It's called VisiCert, and today I'll be telling you about how it works. At a high level, VisiCert takes as input an accessibility guideline, like maybe that that search button is visible, and a web page, and tells you whether or not the guideline holds for all possible renderings of that web page. So when I say all possible renderings, what I'm talking about is over some user configurable range of these inputs, like browser widths, font sizes, and maybe the obscure ones, like the width of your OS scroll bar. And across this range of parameters, VisiCert will tell you whether or not your guideline holds. In particular, it'll either give you a sound guarantee that the guideline holds, or it'll provide a concrete counterexample rendering, which VisiCert believes violates that guideline. And it does this in three steps. So first, the VisiCert user, that's a web developer, formalizes their accessibility guideline in visual logic. Then, VisiCert constructs the space of possible renderings of the page, given those parameters, using a semantics of CSS that we've developed. And finally, this space of renderings is searched for a counterexample to that assertion by encoding it to SMT and then using an off-the-shelf SMT solver to solve that query. So I'm going to go into each of these, and I'm going to start with visual logic. So when we think about a guideline for how a web page should look, we are thinking about good behaviors, uh, like this one, where that search button is within the blue toolbar, and bad behaviors, like here, where it is occluded. 
So visual logic is a way to write down the property that separates good from bad. So for example, here, I've given an assertion that introduces two boxes of interest, that's the for all b1, b2. Then it's constrained b1 to be the search button and b2 to be the toolbar using a CSS selector. And finally required that the search button be geometrically contained within the toolbar. So you can see that this assertion, we've got, uh, we've got some universal quantification that introduces boxes of interest. We've got some structural properties that relate to the way the page is structured, finding the search button, the toolbar. And also some layout properties that talk about the eventual geometry of the page when rendered. And really, these are the three things that you get with visual logic. You get universal quantification. You get structural properties that you can think of as discussing the page HTML. And you've got layout properties that you can think of as discussing the CSS. So uh, we've built this logic, and as I'll tell you later, we've encoded a lot of real-world usability and accessibility guidelines into it. So now let me tell you a bit about how we construct this space of possible renderings of a web page. You see, uh, across these differing parameters, a web page can have a lot of different renderings. And uh, what, how it can be rendered is defined by the CSS standards. There's a, just a bit over 100 of these. They are hundreds of thousands of words of text. And so to give you a sense of how complicated these are, implementing these correctly means writing a web browser. But first of all, not all web browsers implement the full standard. And second of all, a web browser knows what browser width, what font size, et cetera, it is being rendered at. To do verification, we have to build not just a web browser, but a symbolic web browser. And we've chosen to do this within the constrained language of SMP solvers. So uh, I've been doing that for the last four years. Two years ago, uh, I published at Oopsla 2016 uh, a small subset of CSS, just sort of the core pieces. And this was enough to discuss the high-level st visual structure of the page, what we called web page skeletons. Since then, we've expanded this subset significantly. And it now suffices to represent full web pages. Of course, it is still a subset, but real web pages, as I'll tell you later, fall within our supported subset. And I want to give you an understanding of what that took. There's a key challenge I'll be going into and demonstrating on line height, margin collapsing, and floating layout. See, the, what unifies these three things is that each of them is described in the standard in terms of these complex logical constructs, like quantifier alternation, fixed points, or complicated data structures. To reason about these efficiently, in an SMT solver, we had to find equivalent ways of formulating these that use a finite number of operations on basic data types. So here's how we did that, and I'll start with line height. Line height is defined in CSS as the distance between the uppermost box top and lowermost box bottom over all of the boxes in a line, where a, a box is a continuous span of text all in one font. And this is important because a line of text can mix, t a line can mix text of different fonts, different sizes. And what's challenging about the way this is formulated is it represents a maximum over an arbitrary size set of boxes in a line of text. So to represent this sort of arbitrary size operation, we had to encode it incrementally. In other words, every box computed the running minimum and maximum for all boxes to the left of it in that line of text. And that means we're tracking two real numbers per box in order to do this minimum and maximum. OK, so let's do something a little harder. Uh, margin collapsing is defined in the standard in terms of this thing called adjoining vertical margins. And what's important to know about adjoining vertical margins is that this is a transitive property. Determining whether two vertical margins adjoin is a reachability condition. So as we know, that's not something you can easily do or can do at all in first order logic. And this actually comes up. So here I've drawn a box in green, and I've drawn its bottom vertical margin as that green arrow. And what that margin means is that if another box is placed after it, it is moved far enough down to avoid that margin. But uh, there's this quirk in the rules that if a box is zero height, like this blue one, its top and bottom margins adjoin with each other. 
And so transitively, any box that comes after the blue one, like this orange one, will have its top margin adjoining with that green bottom margin. So you get this weird overlap through that blue box. And this actually happens to real web pages and is important to understanding their behavior. So in order to represent this kind of reachability idea in SMT, we had to find a new algorithm for computing margin collapsing. And this uses a combination of top-down and bottom-up traversals to compute the minimum and maximum over all adjoining margins without ever having to explicitly determine whether two margins adjoin. So that's using these six basic data types, uh, five reels, one boolean, for every box in the page to compute this margin collapsing. Okay, but the final and most challenging of these aspects of CSS that we've formalized is floating layout. So floating layout is formalized in this horrible mess of rules, but uh, pay attention to the last two, which tell you that a floating box has to be placed as high up and as far to the side of the page as possible. And what's interesting about these, these are not just constraints over where the box goes. These are optimization problems that that position has to solve. So to do this in SMT, we had to find an exact solution to that optimization problem. And we did in terms of a concept that we call an exclusion zone. So this is a region of the page where floats are not allowed, and it's gonna be everything above this red line. Every time we want to lay out a box that is floating, it is placed as far up and to the left as possible, or if it's a right float, to the right, given the current exclusion zone. And then there's a set of mechanical rules for updating that exclusion zone. So you can see that that first floating box will influence the placement of this second floating box, and so you get these cascading effects that can be difficult for web designers to reason about. And of course, this floating box will go on to influence the placement, for example, of text. Now it turns out that this exclusion zone, this red line, always takes the sort of stair step shape that I've drawn here. Or actually, there's also a right float, so it's two stair steps, but close enough. So we can represent this in SMT by writing down the coordinates of each step in the staircase. And if we know, I'll explain in a moment how we might know, if we know that k steps is sufficient, then we can write down this data structure, one copy of it at every box, using 5k plus two registers, 5k plus two basic data types. And for now, just think of k as some number less than or equal to seven. I'll describe in a moment how we find it. Okay, so what, we've, what I've described here is how we've taken these complex logical features and we found equivalent ways of representing the same semantics using simple, basic, finite operations on simple data types. So now that we've done all that setup, let me tell you how we actually encode this all to an SMT query. So at a, at a high level, the SMT query looks something like this. First, we introduce the HTML and CSS that defines the web page. Of course, we're not gonna do it as strings, it's gonna be a structured representation. Then we're gonna introduce an abstract set of rendering parameters, which again have these user constraints, and an abstract layout. And we're going to ensure that that layout is a valid counterexample to the assertion by requiring that it is both a rendering of the page and fails to satisfy the assertion. So this is just a common, this is how you do verification with SMT. So this means that when we pass this query to the solver, it will either give us unset, meaning no counterexamples could be found, the page is valid, or it will give us a counterexample that we can return to the user. Simple. Okay, but uh, this render function, this is the semantics of CSS that I was telling you about earlier. So, if you'll recall, it is parameterized by this integer k. So in order to ensure that we've picked a sufficiently large value of k, we're gonna search either for a counterexample to the assertion or for a web page that uses more than k registers to render. And so that means that when we pass the query, now parameterized by k, to the solver, we can get a third kind of output, a page that needs more than k registers, and we will use that kind of output to tell us that we need to increment k. Okay, so that's how VisiCert works. Now let me tell you a little bit about how well it works. We've evaluated VisiCert on 14 assertions that we've gathered from best practice sources like the Department of Justice Implementation Guide. So these are things like the main button should be big enough, text shouldn't overlap, or more important headings should look more important. And we found that we had to do two things to encode these into visual logic. The first is that some of these assertions had to be customized to the page in question. 
So we have to identify which button on the page is the main button. And the other thing we had to do is formalize some design principles. So, for example, the highest level heading should look more important than lower level headings. But what does it mean to look more important? Well, we chose to say that a higher level heading should have bigger text than lower level headings. Of course, if you don't like this, if you use a different way of representing importance on your page, you can use whatever assertion you'd like. And we took these 16 assertions, we ran them against a corpus of 62 web pages that we've gathered for a from a popular online forum for web designers. And so, of our 14 assertions, we had six of them that were customized to a page, so they were run on one of those 62 pages. And the other eight required no customization, and so they ran on all 62. And that gave us a total of just under 500 of these web page property combinations. And the results of that looked something like this. So first, I'd like to draw your eye to the fact that for 64 of these page property combinations, we found real bugs in these professionally designed pages. So these are real accessibility problems in these pages. And then for the 388 where we did not find a problem, keep in mind that VisiCert provides a sound guarantee. So this is maybe the first ever proof that a web page satisfies an accessibility property. Okay, but we also have these 3% uh, of false positives, 2% of timeouts, so I wanna just go into our true and false positives just a little bit. Here's an example of a true positive. So this is a sidebar of one of the web pages in our corpus. And you can see that the sidebar title here is in a smaller font than the sidebar subtitle here. So that violates that header hierarchy assertion. Uh, and here's an example of a false positive. I thought this one was really interesting. Here, VisiCert thinks that the word sale and that date range might overlap. Now, of course they do not. Uh, and the reason VisiCert thinks this is because it does not reason about the rendering of individual English letters. It thinks about spans of text all in one font. So it doesn't know that the word sale doesn't have any descendants. If the word were bargain, then there would be a text overlap, and that is the false positive that VisiCert is picking up on. Okay, so uh, to get these results where we're testing real world web pages, we needed these finitization reductions. And to give you a sense of how much they help, we took a collection of unit tests from the people that write the CSS standard. So these are used by browsers to ensure that the browsers work correctly. And we ran VisiCert's rendering algorithm on these tests. So 91% of those tests were in the supported subset of CSS, and you know, VisiCert tells you that. And we know that this is largely due to these new finitization reductions we're using in the CSS semantics because these are the sections of the standard related to those reductions, and they compare quite favorably to our prior work in Uppsala where these reductions weren't used, where only 20% of the unit tests were supported. We also checked that VisCert's rendering matched up with Firefox's rendering, like a real browser, and we found a few cases where they differed. So using some reference renderings and trawling the bug tracker, we found that these cases were actually ones where VisiCert's rendering was correct, and Firefox's rendering suffered from these known bugs that they're trying to fix. Finally, uh, VisiCert is pretty fast. So here's a CDF, and you can see that the median runtime was somewhere between one and two minutes, which I think is pretty good. Of course, it depends on what assertion you're testing, but even the most complicated assertion we tested on only brought that median up to three to four minutes. Uh, now, of course, we'd, we'd like to continue improving this. One area that we are now working on is trying to look at reused components that appear on many pages. So, for example, the header and footer on every healthcare.gov page is the same. And if you have thousands of pages, the savings from not rethinking about those can be substantial. So I'd love to chat about that afterward. But in summary, uh, VisiCert works by taking these accessibility guidelines, formalizing them, into visual logic, then computing the space of possible renderings of a page using a semantics of CSS where we're doing these finitization reductions, and finally encoding the result to an SMT query that we solve using an off-the-shelf solver. And that, in total, gives us the first ever automatic verification tool for web page layout properties. Thank you. I'd love to take questions. Hi, Adam. Hello. 
So you talked about several properties that needed to be customized for pages. Uh, are you planning to do some work on automating that customization? Could we have the formal standard of accessibility for web pages that everyone can check against and have a clear idea what it means to succeed? It's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, so uh, Adam, what you're asking is whether these customizations are something that require like real human insight or if there's a way that we could do those automatically. You know, to some extent, uh, there are ways to do this automatically. For example, uh, there's a web standard called ARIA that allows you to add annotations for things like this is the close button of the dialog or this is the main button on the page. Uh, unfortunately, they're little used. Uh, so given the pages that we have seen in the wild and the ones in our corpus, it did actually take us as humans looking at the page to determine oh, this buy now button, this is probably the important one, or this you know, schedule an appointment button is the important one. So uh, if more use were made of those accessibility standards, and maybe more use will be made if there's more tooling around it, then I think this could be more automated. Sort of sounds like uh, asking users to use particular static type systems in their programs, and then you can reject pages that today seem to be OK, but would be realized as, as wrong because they don't have this extra information. Uh, sure. So, I mean, if you wanted to do this uh, in combination with some static type checking, static checking of web pages, you'd want to ensure that users are using those annotations so that your uh, accessibility guidelines can, can fire correctly, can correctly find those points. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Um, yeah. Wow. So I can see that this has taken about four years. Um, it's really impressive. Um, and I, I guess I want you to speculate a little bit. So some of the stuff that you've built is really general. Uh, and, and can be applied to other problems. And so a problem that I'm thinking about is that some of the, the hard stuff that you're talking about here is used for doing everything from making annoying ads to uh, doing things like launching clickjacking attacks. So a, any speculation about that where you're dealing with like multiple CSS files from different sources, you want to ensure that they compose in a nice way? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. So. Um... You're pointing out some security properties. You're asking about clickjacking or you know, advertising that's really annoying. Can we verify that that doesn't happen? Uh, so I think you know, this work on creating a semantics of CSS uh, that hopefully can be reused for, for these approaches, that would be, that's certainly one area. Another area that I think is, is also interesting in terms of security uh, is ensuring some sort of separation so that uh, users can't easily pretend to be part of the UI of the page itself, right? So this is some layout security where uh, users of a website are gaining authority that they shouldn't have because they are dressing themselves up as a part of the page. Uh, hi, this is actually a quick question, conveniently. Um, it seems like some examples are going to be very obvious, the G hanging over some text, and some examples are really not going to be very obvious. What does your tool do in terms of output to let programmers know why this strange floating box is a problem? Yeah, so uh, what the key thing we give to users when their assertion fails is we give them a concrete rendering of the page. So that's like this width, this font size. Um, and we also point out which boxes seem to be violating the assertion. So effectively, you can easily re-verify from that counterexample that we give you that the assertion fails. Now, uh, why it is, what, what causes your page to look like that at that browser width, uh, I think it would be fascinating to try to build that sort of explanatory system, but we haven't done that yet. 